This is a free space. This is a place where I can share my thoughts, okay? This is a safe space. Um, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to After Broadway, the podcast where we deep dive into anything and everything musical theater from the comfort of my car. I'm Tara. I'm Stefania. And in today's episode, we're talking all about Hades Town. Now, I feel like we're about to fight on this episode, and I probably... You're spoiling it. You're spoiling it. Let's go. <laughs> well, I probably would have fought you more last Friday night if we hadn't seen what we saw on Saturday night, which mm. we'll get into that later. Yeah, yeah. But it kind of, like, altered my opinion. But I also In comparison? Like because... Yes. <laughs> but I also feel like this might be a situation where I need to give, like, a double rating based on... Right. The first time I saw it versus like this time that I saw it. Well, I think maybe we'll get into it today, but there are two separate things. When we're rating a show, we kind of rate it as one thing, but yeah. there are kind of two things that are happening. There is a production and then there's the show as it stands on its own. Um, mm-hmm. And those are sometimes two different things. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes when you when you can see how good a production really is, how, how good a show itself is really is is when it survives multiple production, multiple cast changes, all these different things, that's when you can truly see kind of the core of what's there. Yeah. So I think maybe that might be a theme of the episode today. Yeah. Um, So we just saw Hades Town last week, the Toronto touring production of Hades Town um, that Mervish brought um, at the Royal Alex Theatre. It is still on until August 20th. Um, There are rush tickets for Hades Town available. They are $59. And you can also buy, it's in person only, right? 32 partial view um, tickets for $39. So there are a couple options for this. Um, It's also like, decently readily available on Mervish's like if you're looking to book in advance yeah um I did look this morning just to see because I knew we were recording and at like noon all rush tickets were already sold out so right. depends on the day um also um, kind of sorry strange. I'll say sorry yeah. not to interrupt but I rushed on Friday when we went to see it yeah. and basically what I had to do I had to be on right at nine o'clock and I clicked my tickets and went into my cart right away and by five minutes later they're mostly gone but there were a bunch available at nine, so it is doable. But at like nine oh two, when I checked, there was <laughs> the orchestra seats were gone. Yeah. So my seats were great, like dead center back orchestra, no complaints. Yeah. That's where I'd pick usually. Yeah. Um, also, kind of strange that we're recording today because there's been a lot of like Hades Town news today in general. Um, as of five hours ago on the Hades Town Twitter, it says with tonight's one thousand one hundred and forty first performance, Hades Town has officially become the hundredth longest running show on Broadway. Oh, wow. So that's today, July 18th. And then also today on July 18th, we have some casting information. Um, last episode, we talked about Eva Nobozada leaving Hades Town, And today we found out that Philip Boykin is coming in on September 5th as Hades. We both saw him in Once on this Island as, mm-hmm. is that character's name Tauntaun? I think it is. Yeah, Tauntaun Julian. Tauntaun yes, Julian. it's, um, what's her name? His, her dad. Her dad. What is her name? T-Moon. T-Moon's dad. T-Moon. T-Moon's dad. He has a wonderful voice, so it will be mm-hmm. um, nice to hear him sing those songs. And then a different so physicality random. for the role, if Yes, you will. different physicality different. for sure. Um, and then super random, but Betty Who is stepping in to, pay, to play Persephone. Um, I don't really have a comment on this because I don't really listen to any Betty Who, but... As Random? a Lost Culturistas fan, who, <laughs> Betty Who has been a guest on the show. <laughs> she also I'm just performed this. This at, great. what's his name, from Pentatonic's wedding. Right. Yes. This is fun. Sure. This is a fun, Another I'm kind of like different personality for this, yeah. I would say. We've kind of had like the same like Amber Gray kind of types um, yeah. step in to play Persephone ever since she left. And this is a completely left field choice. So yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so that happened today. Um, okay, let's get into Hades Town. Um, we will not, actually, we will start this episode by saying, and like, I don't know if Shar is going to listen to this episode, but maybe I'll time code spoilers for you specifically. So keep an ear out for that. But we <laughs> will be talking about spoilers in this episode because there are a lot of set things that we're going to talk about, and that itself mm-hmm. is a spoiler. So if and you have things not that are seen different this, from Broadway, Broadway to tour. 
Yes. So if you have not seen this production yet and you're planning to see this production, maybe go listen to another episode and then come back to this. <laughs> and if you have seen this production, then I also would like to know your thoughts on the Broadway versus Toronto slash tour, all of that. Um, another thing about Hades Town is that it is going to the West End in 2024. Tickets are on sale now. So this is like making its debut overseas. Um, it's been on for for a pretty long time and the we'll get into it a little bit later but like it's been in development for years so Mm -hmm. it's been like a long process um okay let's start off i guess the best way to talk about this is what is hades town about (laughs) and can you give us a brief synopsis of the orpheus eurydice okay actually i was just looking this up i was on wikipedia because i thought this was important so basically hades town is a retelling of the ancient legend of orpheus and eurydice it's a greek myth um it is about orpheus who is the son of apollo who so he's the son i think they say he's the son of a muse um in the show and who writes music he is gifted musically and he falls in love with a woman eurydice um and in the myth they get married and there is a a prediction that their marriage is not meant to last meant to last and a short time after this prophecy, Eurydice dies unexpectedly, and she is um, taken to Hades. Mm-hmm. So Orpheus is distraught by this, and he descends to Hades to follow his wife. Um, and because Orpheus is protected by the gods, he is able to find her and get there. Um, and normally, Hades would turn someone away, but because Orpheus is so talented musically, he... Um, he is, Hades is moved by the song that Orpheus plays about um, Eurydice. So Hades says, you can take her back, but there's a catch, a twist, a trial, a test. You have to walk by yourself straight ahead, and you have to trust that she's following behind you. You cannot look back at her. And is that for like the rest of their lives? Nope, just until he gets to the top. Not forever, but until he gets to the top, until he gets back to the living world. And so he has to trust that she's there behind him. Um, and but then right how before. Do you, how do you know that you've gotten back to the living? Oh, I guess you just know. You, you, it's like an exit. There's like an exit sign, I assume. Right. Um, and in this legend, right before he gets back to the living world, just a few feet away from the exit, he loses his faith and he turns around and he sees Eurydice, Eurydice behind her, trapping her eternally in Hades in hell. and that's that that was pretty good I feel like you you read a, a brief summary was, and took the pl- the keynotes <laughs> I did some keynotes I got some summary I got the story and so this is a retelling of that story through music through the style of kind of New Orleans big band jazz yeah, yeah. okay I'm gonna ask you two questions here Okay. First question: When you heard that Hades Town existed and that it was a modern retelling of this Greek myth, mm-hmm. what were your original thoughts? Okay, so I wasn't super familiar with the Greek myth, so I just kind of looked it up at that time, I mm-hmm. guess. Um, and I guess I didn't really have that many opinions on it, but I really, just based on everything about it, I really thought I would enjoy it. However, when I did listen to the cast albums available, there's a concept album, there's a live recording available, and now there's obviously the original Broadway cast recording. Um, It did not grab me, and so I kind of never went back to it very often. And then whenever we went to New York, there were always other priorities. I never made it a priority to see it when I was in New York because I, it was, it did not thrill me Mm -hmm. before seeing it. And then, so finally, when it was here in Toronto, I was like, I cannot miss this. I have to talk about it on the podcast. Let's go. I went with my mom, actually. I texted her that morning. I was like, hey, are you free tonight? You have 20 minutes to answer me. Um, And she said yes. And she said, ever since hearing this on your podcast, I've been really wanting to see this. So, Which leads me to my second question. (laughs) Okay. What did you think of Hades? (laughs) I didn't like it. I think that's I think that's a nice way of saying you didn't like it. I didn't like it. 
<laughs> I didn't like it. Sorry. Um, no, I mean, like, over the years, I think, like, post-Tonys, again, like, just with it being, like, in the mainstream media for, like, X number of years, I feel like you kind of decided that, like, as you said, this show, like, wasn't for you, and turns mm. out it not wasn't for you. <laughs> but I didn't think that you would dislike it as much as you did. Yeah, I was... So I went into it thinking I wasn't going to like it, which is maybe, which is on me. That is my fault. I should be more open. But for some reason, I still thought my mind would be changed. <laughs> <laughs> like, I really thought I was going to go into a magical experience. And right. I unfortunately did not. Um, and we could talk about maybe if it was a different production, I could have been, you know, swayed, swayed in that way. But with this specific production, that was not going to do it for me. Right. Um, is it the story? Is it the music? Is it all of the above? I think I've pinpointed three things. I've okay. pinpointed three things. Give it to okay. me. Okay. Um, I find a lot of the music really unmemorable. I find mm-hmm. a lot of the music really unmemorable. Sorry, they're singing the same songs the entire show. How is I that know. unmemorable? <laughs> like there are a few really standout songs that are great and we'll talk about those, but I find a significant amount of the music and the melodies unmemorable also um, it is like 99 percent sung through yeah so that's also which I something normally like. to keep in mind no i know which but I that's typically also something like. to keep in yeah, mind of no like, for sure you're not going in this um to have a break and not like focus like you got to pay attention yeah. because they're it's not speaking scored completely through for sure yeah yeah okay point um, two the point two is, and this some people could say is a feature and not a bug, but it didn't work for me. I found the characterization of all the characters really thin. And mm. you could say, and I understand it, it's because they're characters from a myth. They are meant to be, they're not meant to be real people. They are meant to be people that we project ourselves onto. Um, but in this two and a half hour musical, I did not find the emotional connection really there. I did not find the characterization there. I did not like latch onto any of the characters mm-hmm. um, there. Um, and then the third thing, this is hard to explain. And this is actually going to be like the shallowest one, but I Just really saying. hated the costumes. <laughs> oh, I was not expecting that. I really hated the costumes. <laughs> I hated them so bad. <laughs> Except for the the leather overalls, which we no no love. the leather overalls are really good. The leather overalls are really good, but I really hated the workers' costume in the first half. The leather overalls are good. I really hated the workers' costume in the first half. Whenever the band came forward, I was like, "What are they wearing?" I did not like Persephone's dress. I really didn't like it. The green, the green. Um, Orpheus is just wearing like whatever. I can't really. It's Reeve Carney's daily attire. Yeah. is what Orpheus is wearing. The the men look fine to me but I really the outfits and the fates also look fine I really could not get past the outfits (laughs) this is so shallow but I really hated them (laughs) um I really thought you were gonna say the cast but maybe we'll get into that a little later that's kind of like to me that's like a separate thing if that makes sense like those things that I just talked about are like the show itself um if Although, we're going to get into it, I did not care for this cast. Yeah, I, I do think, though, that the cast has something to do with your second point of, like, chemistry and just, like, emotional connection with these characters. Because I can say that watching Reeve Carney and Evil Novozada do this part on Broadway, I'm getting mm. the emotional relationship, which right. I felt like I was not getting sure. with... Um, J. Antonio Rodriguez and Hannah Whitley in Toronto. Now, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's like a tour direction oversight or we're alone in that because the reviews out of this mm-hmm. are really good. Yeah. But I think this is something that goes with what you were saying to me of like, if you don't know what exists on Broadway, then mm-hmm. there's nothing to compare it to. And in yeah. your eyes, this is like, this is the only production because yeah. it's the only one that I'm seeing. Whereas like this, I think, and not always because we've seen some really good tours, um, mm-hmm. but I do think that this is the case of like, it's not as good and it's like really not as good as Broadway, which is like sad and unfortunate. And I don't know if like a different cast 
would change that. I don't know. There's something that didn't work. I did not hate this as much as you hated this, mm-hmm. but I also loved it when I saw it on Broadway. Right. But I also saw the original cast. So I feel like there was a lot going for that production. It was very, very hyped up at the time that I saw it. It was right after the Tony Awards that year. They were nominated for 14 Tonys. They won eight Tony Awards. So it's not like people don't like this material. No, absolutely. People like this material. It's like critically acclaimed, whatever. But moving it into a Mervish space, which I think like they thought everyone would run to it, which it seems like people are. They have. have. I don't know why it's not working for us. I also thought act two was like way worse than act one, which is surprising. Well, yes. Well, that comes back to a production issue. This is actually a third. Maybe this is my actual third thing besides the costumes. This is too long. It's way too long. It's It's too long. long. And also, we've made this claim a million times, and I don't know what we can do about it, but the Royal Alex needs to fix their sound system. So this is interesting. I did not find that, but I had seats almost dead center, like two or three rows ahead of the sound booth. So it was mixed for me optimally, whereas your seats are on the side. On the side, like closer to the stage. Yeah. Yeah. But you also said that this is a show that might need a closer view so that you can be in it. Yes, yeah. I think I think I think this is a show that would benefit greatly from a really intimate production. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been I've seen like there's only a few videos um, of I think it's New York Theater Workshop. Yeah, production. It was like 2016 um, or 2017 is when yes. that happened. And I'm like, ooh, I think I would like this a lot more. Have you seen any of the videos from Citadel? Because it's similar. Just very few, very few. Yeah, but this is kind of. I mean, when you bring things to Broadway, obviously the house is plus 500. How many seats did the Walter Kerr have? Ooh, I don't know. Let's look. Walter I'm just curious. Kerr. The Royal Theater. Alex in Toronto is the smallest of the big houses. But of the still big. Houses. But it is, I believe, like 1,200 seats So the Walter Kerr is 975. Okay, that's actually fairly the small. the Royal Alex capacity is 1244 so yeah. it's significantly bigger than bigger than the walter kerr but to me i don't know the way that the royal Alex is like put um is mapped out in there it feels small even though it's not but i guess yeah. that's probably like the orchestra because when you get up to the uh mes- the balcony is so steep up there oh my god it's yeah. so steep i don't know the, the last royal time Alex. i sat up there I sat up there for like Dear Van Hansen, like the last time I saw it. It was, Mm. it's so high up there. Um, Whereas like the Walter Kerr uh, orchestra is a little more like spaced out. Royal Alex Mm -hmm. is pretty like tight together, seats wise. And the stage is like, that's to me, the biggest issue here is the actual stage size. And I understand, I mean, are we going to get into stage mechanics here? I don't know if this is the time, but like, should I get into it? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Um, this is a show that, like, the set, to me, at least when I saw it on Broadway, the set feels like a character because so much is happening on that set. And here, I understand that you need to make adjustments for tour spaces. Obviously, you're traveling this stuff in, like, trucks when you cross the border. You you do something that's adaptable for any theater. You don't know what you have in the theater you get to, so all you can do is what you bring with you. Yeah. Um, but... For that, things have to suffer. And um, on Broadway, it's like a double turntable with like an elevator lift um, kind of thing. And here, it's a single turntable with no elevator lift. They did do the like stage growing when we go down to hell, but not Mm -hmm. nearly as many times as it was done on Broadway. It just felt bigger. It just felt grander. And I think that that obviously like helps you tell your story of a show where you're in between hell and regular land. The living, the living world, the living world. Yeah. Yes. So to be honest, I had seen a few like videos and clips and stuff. I personally did not miss anything until the climactic moment at the end. Let's save that. Yes. When we like, we'll go through it. But I agree the way that they do the hell entrance transitions. Yeah. It's it's basically like, it looks like an industrial like garage door that kind of opens like a It's like an elevator door. Yeah. It's like an elevator. Um, 
And you first, I, I thought the very first entrance when the workers when, came in on that was really good. When they were wearing the leather overalls coming yeah. out of that door was really good. I thought when, like when Hades, Hades entrance, came out the first Hades time from there, great. that was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but agree. Uh, we really suffered at the end, which we'll get to a little later in this episode with that no stage trick. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's that. Um, do we want to talk about, mu- like, where do we want to go here? Music. Let's talk about like, songs. Let's talk about okay. songs here. So, um, not to be a hater. I'm not a hater. There are songs you are I like. You a hater. I am a hater. Sorry, this is my opinion. And I come here. This is a free space. This is a place where I can share my thoughts. Okay? This is a safe space. Um, <laughs> not today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> not today. No, no, no. no. Um, so, there are some songs that I really, really like. One that I love, I love When the Chips Are Down. I think when the chips are down mm. is really good. I love I when the, the fates, fates I love in the general fates. you love. I love the fates. I think like I wish they used the fates more. I wish mm-hmm. we had more of the fates. Do you, so you were saying you don't think they're really playing the instruments. I but don't. I thought they and were. I, I only say this because um, I was watching like the other violin player and then w- one of the fates doesn't play an instrument. She's got like a castanet moment or something. Sometimes she's just like moving a her tambourine. arms and she's clapping. Like other times she's got like, with, like bells, bells on yeah. a string. Yeah. So then and then one of the fates has a violin and one of them has an accordion. And I was watching the violin player because there's a moment in the show when it's like kind of dark and they're just like using... It's like a, I don't even know how to describe it, but they're kind of just like scraping the bow of the violin on the violin to get like a really like minory, crunchy sound. And then at the same time, like they're playing the accordion. So I was watching the actual violin player who was doing the exact same thing. And I was like, (laughs) oh, okay, they might be doing it together. But then I realized that the music director was playing the (laughs) accordion. I was like, oh, I don't think she's doing it. (laughs) But unknown. I don't know. Um, because that was my favorite part. they have to be part. listed in the program? As, that's a like, great question. As like part of the band, if they were, yeah, that's that's. But the is thing. is is Orpheus? Because I think he's really playing guitar. I agree, he's really playing guitar, especially it's, at the end. I mean, we are not going to get into it, but it is giving Roger from Rent. <laughs> I so I came so the next day we saw Rent and Stratford, and I came home and I was telling my mom the story of Rent. I was like, have you seen this before? I don't know, blah, blah, blah. She's like, he's trying to write one great song. And she's like, like in Hades Town." And I'm like, <laughs> literally, yes. I was thinking about why are artists always writing about creating art, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Like, Well, also, it's about, like, it's the same thing. Like, he's writing about creating art, but he's also, like, trying to get the girl, right? Like, the the Roger to Orpheus pipeline is very similar. We're well, getting the thing a, is, it's an Orpheus to Roger pipeline, because Orpheus, as a character, yes, yes, yes. has been yeah. around for thousands of years. But, like, the opening chords of, like, One Song Glory, I yeah. would say, are, like, reminiscent <laughs> of the la-la-las from la, Hades Town, la, la. And then the also, motif. The motif. Roger's, like, I'm writing one great song is very similar to, like, King of Shadows. King of Shadows. Oh, my God. Well, I can't even talk about that. It's gonna get me angry. <laughs> it's gonna piss me off. Um, but, yes, back to the fates. You love when the chips are down. And- I love when the chips are down. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm I'm opening up my list of songs. I love work songs. Chant. Keep your head, keep your head low. Chant. Yes. Great. I love chant also. I love chant. Those are great. Um, I think, and then obviously to me, the two most famous songs from the show are "Wait for Me" and "Why We Build the Wall," and I think those are both very good as well. Um. Yes, you said. After we saw it, that Hades Town really picked up after they sang "Wait for Me," and I was like, "That's the second last song before we go to intermission." But like, really great that you felt that way. Yeah, the one that chips down is a little bit before that, um, <laughs> and there's a chant before that. But a lot of other stuff bores me. Um, Whereas I live for the duets, the ballads. I love no. all I've ever known. I'm asleep. I'm falling asleep. I love. Um, I do. <sighs> I didn't love it this time, but when I saw it on Broadway, I do love Living It Up on Top. Um, Amber Gray, like, really gives on that cast recording. It felt quite, like, thin to me the other night. Just the whole everything. Yeah, I think it might have been who was singing it. 
but I don't know for sure. Also, you were very distracted by the one ensemble member, so I think that didn't help the situation. Either. We'll get we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. My other issues. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just looking at the um, cast recording. I mean, I I do love the um, beginning of the show. Uh, I love the opening "Road to Hell" when we get oh that like God. amazing. Not even the lyrics. I love the. Trombone, yeah, that's good. From the trombone player is actually the star. The trombone player is the star of the show. The star of the show is the drummer that was backstage. <laughs> he comes up with like a little drum. Well, that's interesting because on Broadway he's on stage, but on off Broadway or on tour he's off stage. Yeah, like you backstage. also probably don't care for any way the wind blows. Honestly, no. like anytime like Eva gets to just like sing a ballad, I'm I'm here for that. Um, I don't even like Way Down Hades Town. I think it's kind of bad. I agree. The Epics, or sorry, chant is really good. Uh, keep your head low. We not the that. epics. I would no, no, never stand That's for an epic. King of Shadows. Sorry, um, never stand for that. Uh, I'm trying to think what else here. I don't know. The second act kind of drags. So this song is wise, the, this is another thing. Oh, right? sorry. Before we get to that, my favorite song in the second act is "Doubt Comes In," hands down. The Fates singing Doubt Comes In. Yeah, I agree. That's when, that's yeah. right after that is when they're doing like the crazy instrument stuff. I agree. That's really good. That's good. And also like that is the moment. Um, that is the main moment. That is the moment. So. That is the moment. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think that's pretty good. What I'll say is, so at the end of act one, right, mm-hmm. Eurydice is in hell. Orpheus also in hell. And I'm like, yeah. so what else is there to do? All we do got to go is come back out. Yeah. So to me, that should take 10 minutes. Why are we doing another hour of this? Because we have to sing Epic 3 five the, times. The pacing of this is wrong. The pacing is off. I, I Rachel Chavkin, <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. I, even when I was thinking, like, I remember someone asking, maybe it was Shard, basically, being like, why don't you want to see it? And I was like, I really feel like I'm going to get bored in the middle. Mm-hmm. because. And you did. And I did. Because there's nothing to happen. There's nothing happening. They, I'm trying to find they drag here. out this story. So it was the 2019 Tony Awards. They won Best Musical. They were nominated for Best Book of a Musical. Lost. They won Best Score. Who won um, Best Book? Who won? I'm curious. Tootsie? Who won Best Book of a, a Musical? Oh, my God. Was it Tootsie? No. What was it? what was it? 2019. Let me scroll down. It was Tootsie. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't even. I can't even defend that. That's so bad. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh no, 2019. What were you what doing? Year? Who else was nominated? Um, Let's see if there's anything better. Who else was nominated? Uh, Ain't Too Musical. Proud, Beetlejuice, Hades Town, The Prom. I don't really. That's know. a mistake. This is all bad, kind of. Honestly, <laughs> Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. Mm, sure. An ad- For the good like time. An I'm wondering well, if this is a totally separate thing, but I'm wondering if the Tony should have something like original versus adapted. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Oscars, yeah. But honestly, they're all kind of adapted at this point. So what was original I, of that list? Yeah, none of them. Tootsie was a... Well, a the movie. prom, maybe. It was based on like a newspaper article, but... Oh, true, yeah. Like a true story, but maybe that yeah. could be the original one. I don't yeah, know I don't exactly know. what the rules are. But yeah, it's hard. Um, Eva lost for lead actress. Reeve was not nominated, which was controversial at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Andre De Shields won featured actor in a musical. Patrick Page was also nominated. Um, Amber Gray lost featured actress. And then it won scenic design, which I do think that is deserved. Um, the industrial set is really beautiful. I mean, the lights in uh, Wait For Me are so iconic to that show. Yes. I remember you were saying that like you were afraid that they weren't going to go up high enough to swing. Well, I okay, so this is because I didn't I wasn't super familiar with the staging, but when the workers came out, they were holding them. Yeah. And I thought because it was tour, you don't always get everything that Broadway gets, that that was going to be the thing that they were going to manually swing them, that they weren't <laughs> going to get to do it. But then I saw the the wires coming down from the ceiling. I was like, "Okay, we're going to get it. We're going to get it." Yeah. And that's another th- reason why I think being closer would be good for a moment like that to get those lights really close to you as opposed to me far back yeah I could also see from where from where I was sitting because obviously the band is on stage they took out like the pit is covered for this show because normally they would be in the pit so they added a couple like extra rows it Mm. looked like in the audience or if not it's just that that first row starts like a little bit behind the pit I was watching 
Those lights they were go swinging far. over their heads. They were literally in the audience over their heads. The other thing, though, that if you are sitting in the first couple rows, like, beware of all of the smoke that comes out into the A lot the of crowd. dry ice. A lot, there's a of, lot dry of dry ice. ice. Especially once we get into hell, there's a lot sure. of dry ice. A lot of dry um, ice. But then, yeah, then they were nominated for costume. Oh, wow, Steph. Nominated for costume. I have strong feelings about the costumes. <laughs> Um, and then they won lighting, they won sound design, they won direction, and uh, were they nominated for they choreography. Won, they were, and they I hate also the choreography. Won orchestrations. I know. Let's talk about the choreography. Why do you hate it so much? I just felt it was super basic and mm-hmm. unoriginal. Um, Even during like chant, you didn't like that. No, I like that. that chant okay. was great. Chant was peak for me. That's um, also when the turntable is introduced. So yes, that's exactly. Fun. The yeah. Turntable in hell only. Um, yeah. I, what I didn't, so there are like a couple things. I felt that the ensemble altogether was not grounded and grungy enough. And this is where it comes in with costumes and where it comes in with choreography and where it comes in with the beautiful, very tall blonde lady who's in the ensemble who sticks out like a sore thumb. And I'm sure she's very talented, but she should not be in the show because she looks so out of place. Yeah. Um, I want beautiful everyone in the singing voice when beautiful. she started. No, no, when she so sang like a portion of a random song, was like, "Oh, girl, you must yeah, be a Eurydice like understudy or a she fate. Is. She might be a fate understudy. I think she's or both. both. I think, I she's, think both. she's both. Yeah, really stunning, beautiful, so talented, but she sticks out so much in this show. She does not have the look of the show. Also, now my turn to be a little shallow, but like this is a lo- this is a lot of people's like tour debuts, mm-hmm. and it kind of shows. So. I don't know. I don't know. That's all I'm going to say about that. But yeah, she really did stick out and not out. in a good way. Yes. Uh, especially with this worker ensemble, they kind of... I mean, they used to have the tall man. They used to have Timothy Hughes in the ensemble and the original Broadway cast. But the way that they're kind of supposed to become this like faceless, personalityless group that they've lost their souls by being in hell for so long and then they kind of get them back at the end... Um, I kind of wanted them just to kind of be a little more homogenous. Um, and yeah, I want them to be using their knees more. Get that plie. Get that plie mm-hmm. in. Um, mm-hmm. I think actually five is a great number for them because it's a small cast. Five is a good number for the workers. And then when you add Eurydice, it becomes six, which is an even number. So it like completes it. I think that was good. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I found the choreography just like really simple and like unoriginal to me yeah. and just kind of awkward looking. And I wanted it to be a little like rougher because this is if if it's being inspired by new orleans by louisiana by you know almost like speakeasies and uh like the underground world not necessarily hell but you know underground uh establishments that's what i'm reading as it like i just want it to feel a little dirtier Dirtier. yeah and it's not as dirty as i want to and this is what i'm talking about my costumes what I, I just despise so much the outfits that the workers are in before they are in the overalls. Like the jeans. The skinny, like, khaki pants. Okay, and this is, I have a theory. I was developing this. I've been ruminating on this theory. A lot of times, especially when shows have, like, costumes have more modern outfits in them, you can kind of tell when the original production was staged because mm. of the style of clothing that they're wearing and they're all wearing skinny things. They're yeah. all like even Eurydice has tights and boots. The workers have these tight pants. Um, yeah, they're all wearing like Doc Martens, basically. Yes, and I'm like, oh, this. When was that New York City Theater Workshop production? Like 2016. 2016. Yeah. That was the look. That was yeah, the look actually, in 2016. In the, in the uh, program here, they have like the. Under Rachel Chavkin's name, they have, like, all of the production notes. So it says, mm. the world premiere was at New York Theatre Workshop uh, May 2016. Mm. Then it received its Canadian premiere at the Citadel November 2017. Mm. UK National Theatre. Oh, I forgot it was there first. Yeah. Like a small theatre. Right. Um, 2018. Broadway 2019. And then I think it's been touring since 2020. I think it, like, started early 2020. Like, like pre-pandemic. Post- Oh, really? I think pre-pandemic? It was pre-pandemic. Was it yeah. Pre-pandemic? Okay. I interesting. think it, it think it might have been. Um and then so, it's obviously had its hundredth show on Broadway, and as I said, it's going to the West End next year. So like there's no signs of this slowing down. Yeah, and uh, 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 this is my unpopular opinion. Like, I can be wrong. 
I know, shocking. No, no, no. I can't you don't wrong. have to be wrong. There's no, 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 no right or wrong in abso- this. You're so right. Yeah. You're so right. There's no incorrect <laughs> or correct. But obviously, this speaks to so many people, and like, I think it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, so that first major production was in 2016, and I can tell based on the skinny jeans everyone is wearing. Like, right. update these outfits. It felt awkward because it was so tight. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're doing these movements. Why are they in such tight clothes? They should be in looser clothing. They should be a little more modern. I, I just don't think it quite works. Even when the band, like the trombonist, loved her. She was amazing. She came out in this fedora. And I was like, get that fedora off. Get but like, that fedora was off. that a personal <laughs> choice? Or was she wearing a costume? Because at first I thought it might have been a personal choice. <laughs> she was also in a skinny pant. I was I like. Know. And a combat boot. I was like, get them out. But then you have the complete, like, flip side of that, which, with, like, Hades and Hermes. They have good outfits. Good outfits. Yeah, but but Hades also looks like he's out of, like, a Beetlejuice cartoon. A mob (laughs) film. Yes. I know. What's what's he... Is he giving mob boss? This, like, pinstripe zoot suit moment? He's giving, like... Have you ever seen, like, the animated Batman with, like... (laughs) The Joker I, wearing I can't a top hat and like a pinstripe suit. That's what he's giving. I cannot say I have. Mob boss. <laughs> mob boss. Yeah, he's giving mob boss. And he's Hermes giving, is wearing like and a, I can say that. A, me- a metallic <laughs> suit with, I do appreciate the like I, wings. On I noticed the like halfway cuffs. through the wings on the cuffs. I think that's cute. I think that's sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. The, I think those are the strongest two costumes, the men's suiting. Um, but I did hate when he came out in the sunglasses. I really thought that was super cheesy. Super yeah. corny. I didn't like that. It's actually like it's so giving. I just got LASIK. Not even that. It's, it's giving like the Green Goblin and Spider Man turn off the dark, <laughs> which it was twice in a row. Patrick Page <laughs> giving the same character twice. Why is um, he always giving a villain? It's that deep voice. It is the that deep resonant voice. Tone. Also, like shout out to um, Matthew Patrick Quinn because that baritone. He was my favorite. Um. But yeah, and then Orpheus is wearing like almost like a waiter esque outfit with like yeah, because he works at the bar. It's like a Henley that's a three quarter sleeve with like a red bandana, and then very unflattering brown pants. Yeah, <laughs> D- something else, please, something else. Although, and he doesn't change the I, whole show. No, he doesn't. And I think I had Everyone said changes. this to you after I saw it on Broadway. But when I saw it on Broadway, I swear Reeve Carney left the stage door wearing that exact same outfit. <laughs> he took off the costume <laughs> and put on his own. Like he Maybe just he walks around. A suspender, but like he was wearing the bandana. That is part of his daily look. He does wear the bandana all the time. Who told him that was a look? Who told I him? Think that? He's been wearing it since 2017 at the Citadel. <laughs> like, like who told him that? <laughs> He put on you know, the costume and he's him. like, "It works for him. This is me. This is my second skin." The and as we man. said last week, that man will like die in this show. He's not going anywhere. He loves staying in a show. He loves to stay in he, a show. He lo- he loves singing. <laughs> la, 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 la. La, la, la 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 la. Okay, let's talk about epic three. Why one, two, and three? One, Tell two, us about the three. epics. Tell us your thoughts on the epics. I really don't have anything to say except that I found it really unpleasant to listen to, mm-hmm. and that's that. Mm-hmm. And that is also separate from the performances we saw. I just, the song was boring. It didn't give me any anything inspiring. This is the moment. I do think it is better than One Song Glory. Or not One Song Glory. I do think it's better than Your Eyes, though. Everything is better than Your Eyes. It's better than Your Eyes. But Although, did I cry during Your Eyes <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the other day? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. we were on the journey. This show didn't take me on the journey. I know we said we're not going to talk about it, but there are, like, many, there are many, there are like, parallels, parallels to Rent. Yeah. And honestly, Hades Town's biggest downfall of it being in Toronto right now is that Rent is an hour and 45 minutes away, and it is fantastic. Like, yes. it is so freaking good. So, like, that is the biggest downfall right now to Hades Town because the stories are kind of similar. Um, I do want to talk about the fact that when I saw it on Broadway, I saw Hades Town matinee and I saw Moulin Rouge night, and they're kind of the same storyline. Well, Moulin Rouge is also based on the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Um, obviously, and I- with. Various changes, I, but... I do think that Moulin Rouge's storytelling of this tragedy is a little better. That also might be an un- unpopular opinion. It, like, they're so different. They're so different. But I do think that the characters and motivations are slightly better developed in Moulin Rouge, which is actually such a hot take because... <laughs> That's what I mean. This is a very unpopular opinion. <laughs> like, what a take. I can't believe, I can't believe we're saying that. 
um, because they are a little <laughs> bit also not good. But um, that show has energy all the way through in a way that Hades Down I didn't feel had energy all the way through. And yeah. Obviously, that's for many reasons, including the fact that it's popular music that you're familiar with. It's yeah, a little more yeah. tongue in cheek. It's trying to be funny, like it's leaning into comedy in Moulin Rouge, whereas mm-hmm. I felt Hades Town took itself really seriously to its detriment sometimes. I think it's not, like, I think it takes itself so seriously. Really seriously, but then also at the same time, it's like incredibly over the top. Mm hmm. Yes. Which, like, the way. And I've always thought this, and again, I I did love it when I saw it on Broadway, but I've always thought that, like, the characterization of Orpheus is so annoying. Like, the way that he speaks is so annoying. And it does feel, I don't, like, it's definitely not supposed to be, like, parody campy, but if you deliver that line in a specific way, you are teetering on the line of camp. I felt, I, I turned to my mom, I'm like, I think this is really corny. I think this is really mm-hmm. corny, this show. Um... So that, yeah. And also you really did not like how over the top Hermes characterization yes, is. Yes, I, Tara was telling me that. Um, Shout out to Nathan Lee Graham, who I love in Zoolander. Wonderful. If his, anyone's seen Zoolander, he is Will Ferrell's right hand man. His, his name is Todd. His voice is beautiful. <laughs> um, but I found the kind of stylistic choices he was making as Hermes hard to understand like, he's giving so much backstory and exposition. He's and, narrating. Yes. And the tone of everything he was saying, I'm like, I have no idea what words are coming out of your mouth. Everything was so stylized and pulled in different yeah. directions with his words. Yeah. I'm like, you're doing too much. There's his a way best to stuff do was a lot. when he, he stripped it back and was more yes. serious. That was his best stuff. Yes. Like, right before, like, Wait For Me. Wait For Me reprise, where he's like, or even, I don't even know, when he's, like, explaining things, when it's getting a bit more serious. 100% agree, but when, during, like, Road to Hell, when it's like, on the road to hell, I was like, I can't. <laughs> was that a good impression? I don't it. even know. That kind of was It's it. just, it's the enunciation. It's so, it's like yelly. Yeah, mm-hmm. he really was, like, performing. He was very open. His, his, and I his say, vocal like, cords were open. Andre the Shields definitely did a similar take, but he's also, like, 70 something so it didn't come across he's, as like he's being held as much by energy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i watched a few clips of honor to shields and i preferred his performance to it it's a little classier yeah just a little uh a little more like he's throwing it away a little bit more he's a little more like you're listening to me like he's drawing you in as opposed to you know nathan lee graham being like look at me you know yeah, what i yeah, mean yeah. Um, yeah, it's just slightly subtler. Though I can imagine, like the lyri- the lines are exactly the same, and there are jokes for them to tell. So, like, I can imagine him being a little bit over the top. But I just think he like drives me more restrained. But I didn't see him. I like the performance that Chris Sullivan gives on that live cast recording as well. Um, I when do. We, when we found out that it was Toby, Toby from, from This Is Us. Us. Uh, we were recording like a video in the back of my car as like a singing video. I don't even know if I released that. I got. I don't even know no, if I still did. have you that did. clip. No, I think that I clip, released the like. It's I Toby. Think, I think that clip is. I gotta it. find it. The, the, I think that clip made it to the to the edit. If not, there's a moment of us like saying, "Oh my god, it's Toby from This Is Us," and then literally not even missing a beat and going straight into "Wait for Me." It's crazy. Bye. Um. Bye. Okay. Yeah, I do want to. I do want to like give them a a good note here, and I think this is just Hades Town in general. But mm-hmm. um, they have really been a champion for diverse casting um, for mm-hmm. this show, because as I mean, why wouldn't you? First of all, but also this is a storyline that we're talking about like Greek gods that no one mm-hmm. knows what they look like, who they are, if they were even human to begin with. So like, why not cast? the best person for the best part, even if that's not the case for this tour company. Well, no, I agree. I think a lot of times tours, we've said this before, end up looking like generic brand versions or like store brand versions of the Broadway yes. house. They kind of take what they did on Broadway in the most major production. And then they're like, you kind of look and sound like that person. Now just it's do like, it like no that name person. versus yes, like... no name. Exactly. Versus like... <laughs> yeah. Heinz, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, it's just a little bit like Funhouse Mirror, like blurry face. But I don't think Hades Town has done that. I in their casting, I don't think they've tried to mimic what they've captured oh. on the Broadway stage. And even with recasting, sometimes yes. But like we're saying, like Philip Boykin as Hades, that's he looks different from everyone who's played Hades before. Lilius White as Hermes right now, 
like a woman. We're gender bending it. We're just finding someone yeah. with. She's probably giving a performance a little more similar to Nathan Lee Graham. Love Maybe her. Maybe even bigger. <laughs> Maybe even bigger. But I think I would forgive her. Um, <laughs> on the road to hell. Yeah. Um, um, you know, no, it's true. Just look at like the leading characters of this yeah. tour cast. They look absolutely nothing like Reeve Carney and Evil Nova. Yeah. Evil Nova like, And I think that's good. N- not even at all. Yeah. I wish they sounded a little more like them. But yeah. I don't know. I, it's also like I so a couple of my coworkers had seen this, um, and one of them had said, which agree. She's like, it's a lot of falsetto in this show, and it's like, yes, it's a lot of falsetto in this show. On the um, live New York theater workshop, it's not so much falsetto. I think it's just the way that Damon Dano sings. It is, but he's not going high. He's just kind of chest voicing the whole thing. I also feel like they might have done a little bit of reorchestrating for Reeve specifically sure, because this does him. sit like perfectly in his range. We did listen to the Broadway cast recording on the way home and you and your mom did prefer Reeve's He's epic. got the voice of an angel. He's got the voice of an angel. Like there's nothing yeah. else to say about that. I think that. I to quote Anna, I'm pretty sure she <laughs> said, "Well, if he sounded like this, maybe I would have liked it." <laughs> The voice and of an maybe she would have. Um, can we talk about the end? Yes. Now, spoiler alerts for the specific staging of the tour. Yeah. And the Broadway show. And the Broadway show. Yes. Um, so, as you said, the the like concept of this is that the final scene here is that Orpheus and Eurydice are able to leave hell as long as Orpheus walks the road alone and does not look behind him to see that she's following. I don't think I knew very much when I saw it on Broadway. I don't really remember exactly Mm -hmm. how much I knew, how much I didn't know. But I definitely didn't know how this story ended because we did not learn Greek mythology in school. We barely learned Shakespeare in school. Like, we didn't learn very much of this stuff. So this was all, like, a brand new story. I feel like I knew the very, very basics of, like, he writes this music to, like, basically bring back springtime. Hades Mm -hmm. lives in hell with Persephone and yada, yada, yada. So on Broadway, we have the turntables going, which we have the turntables going on tour too. So on Broadway, there's kind of three turntables, right? One going one, another one, and then the circle in the middle. Yes, which is very similar to Hamilton, if anyone has seen Hamilton. Hamilton's just got the two, but yes, on Hades Town, the center one also spins. And very similar to and Juliet, which I think the mm. and Juliet one, the well, yeah, spins. we know that it, the center one spins and lifts. Yeah, it lifts, um, but it doesn't go down. It doesn't go down. Um, so, what was I going to say? T- on tour, there's only one. There's not a second one on tour. Yes, and it, it might be like a half circle. It seems like it's pretty small. So because it's, the it other might be part smaller. of the stage is pretty far forward. Yeah. I think before they're in hell, part of it is covered by oh, and then it the thing. And when it when opens, it opens up the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, that makes it's sense. It's exposed, but you don't need it because you don't start turning until you're in hell. The first time you turn is, I'm pretty sure it's like when the chips are down and Hades is like moving in the full circle around. Yeah. And then obviously when Orpheus sings, wait for me and all that. Um, so on Broadway, anytime you go into hell, uh, or sorry, anytime Eurydice goes into hell, she physically descends into the stage. It's like an elevator. Which, when I saw that for the first time, I'm like, I've never seen a stage trick like this be so effective in a show. This mm. was like post Hamilton, but like we're still like figuring out what we can do with turntables. And I think that this was a really smart, like scenic design route to be like, oh, well, they got to go down somewhere. So let's physically have the actors go down. Great. So when they're on this like journey back to the living, the fates are singing, doubt comes in, Orpheus is walking, Eurydice is walking, the fates are here with their, like, lanterns. The stage is, like, pitch black on Broadway, which I, like, loved, because no matter where you're sitting, there's, like, a very small spotlight on Orpheus, and then obviously when the fates come in with their lanterns, it lights up the stage more, but you have absolutely no idea where Eurydice is the entire time. Mm -hmm. So as far as we know, like, she's already gone like i you're like you orpheus. don't know where she is you don't know if she's yeah. there or not so i just remember like sitting in that audience feeling so nervous because i did not know how this ended wow. and i felt so like tense in my seat to be like oh my god is, th- is he gonna turn around like is she gonna die like what's gonna happen here 
Whereas I feel like here, one, you're trying to decipher what Nathan Lee Graham is saying to him in the first place to know what the actual like journey is, which is not great because that's a really important plot point. Two, it's not dark enough on stage. We are dark at the beginning, which I really appreciated. Also, the music is like really tense at this point. So it's like this building is good. up. This is good music. This is good music. I, I actually think that the instrumental of this entire cast recording is gorgeous yes. from top to bottom. I would listen to it without the lyrics. Like that's how much I enjoy the mm -hmm. instrumental of this. Um, but yeah, not dark enough. And then when the fates come out, I could see her. I don't know if you could see her from where you were sitting, but because I was close, I could see her. Sometimes walking. yes, sometimes no. I could also see her leave because she has to get to like certain points on the stage to hit. Right. So when the fates come in, I saw her like run away, which is like me being very nitpicky, but also mm. I have a comparison so yeah. I can be nitpicky. As someone who's seen the show and who also knows the story, you know what to look for. Whereas someone who's experiencing it for the first time, you know, they not don't necessarily. Even me, let's right. say, who has never seen it before, but I do know what's about to come. Yeah. I am watching for different things than someone who is experiencing it for the first time. Right. And then the other thing, so I had mentioned that the stage grows when they go down to hell. It kind of like breaks apart, opens up, which I think is like stunning. There's lights to show that. It's much, much bigger on Broadway. So when you're getting closer to the living, you really see it shrink back down. So you're like, oh my God, they're really close. He's going to make it. I can't believe he's going to make it, which I didn't get I didn't, that sense. I didn't notice that. Oh my goodness. I didn't notice that. I think it happens here, but it's not as like drastic. So sure. literally like- It's not as big. If you, the stage isn't as big. It's, it's not as big. But like, imagine not knowing anything, seeing all this stuff happen around you. You're hearing this music. I'm like so, so nervous for all of this. So then you see, which is the same thing of like, he walks up the stairs because the like workers are back um, in their living clothes. So we're about to like yeah. re-enter this universe. And then he obviously turns around. On Broadway, you don't really know where she is at this point. It's still kind of dark. You do see like glimpses of the living world come to life, but it's not quick enough that the lights go up and he turns around. So as soon as he turns around on Broadway, lights go up, she jumps into the circle and she descends down to hell. Mm -hmm. The gasps that sure. were in the theater. I burst into tears when that happened. I had never had like such an emotional experience mm -hmm. like that in a theater before. And here I felt nothing, <laughs> like not even an ounce of anything. And it was so funny because mm -hmm. I was talking to, um, one of my coworkers that saw this production and I was asking her specifically, this was like a week before that we saw it and I was asking mm -hmm. her specifically about that moment. And then I described to her the Broadway and she's like, oh my God, I just got chills as you said that. I didn't feel mm -hmm. that way in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure like when I've, I've read like people's reactions on Twitter, someone also yelled out like no when it happened on Broadway. Yeah. So like there are like audible reactions that I think we are missing out from here. And I don't know that like, there's a way to fix it because what happens here is, as we said, there's kind of like a garage door elevator and mm -hmm. you see her like jump into the elevator. Yeah, you, you watch her get into position. And then he turns position. around. You watch her get into position. Um, and I don't so know what else they could do, it, but not that. That's the thing. I don't know what else either because I'm sure they talked about a million different things. Um, and just a trap door of that magnitude is not possible on a tour. It's just not unless you had the stage really high, but it's just not possible. Um, yeah. So but I had also kind never of seen, I'd also never seen an elevator lift because like it slowly descends. And then when you realize that like, oh, she's never coming back from this, she like immediately like it's drops easy. down into the I wonder ground. if she, yeah. I wonder if that's just her crouching. You know what I mean? The elevator it, going the same spot. And she I've just kind of. I've seen a bootleg of a of, of mezzanine a, a, like overview top. and it, it does move a little bit faster, but she yeah, also she's does also like goes, crouch herself down. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, You're just kind of. You're limited by... Totally. And I understand that with a, with a touring production. But if this is your, like, biggest moment, biggest mm -hmm. plot point of the show, I need it to be better than what it was. I'd almost wonder if we could go for something a little more abstract, like mm. have her be pulled away by something or have her, uh, I don't know a little more like manual something instead of instead of the like, like literal elevator 
something just a little yeah. more. Sometimes I wish the whole show was a little more abstract, a little less literal. I don't know. Like the staging I of did. It. I, I this is better than what I thought. I remember we had talked about this like when Hades Town was first announced. I'm like, I swear if she just walks off the stage, like this is not gonna be no, no. good. So it definitely was like better than what it was. And then essentially like we repeat the story over and over and over and over and over again. Orpheus makes yeah. the same mistake every single every time. Night. We we do the same thing. Like and I feel like because you watch her on Broadway like disappear literally she's gone from the show and then you see her like re-enter for the retelling of the story which happens here it's just yeah. that much more like impactful emotional mm-hmm. but yeah like I feel like you had said you had said the other day that watching those like small clips from the New York Theatre Workshop like you would prefer a more stripped down mm-hmm. less in your face production yeah. so I don't know. I don't know exactly how it would work or what they would do for that moment or if it would just become like a lighting moment yeah. or something. But yeah, I don't know if what they did quite worked, but I don't quite see another solution with the show that they have. So we're kind of stuck. The answer is only go to theaters that are rigged for elevator lifts. No, that's, that's really not the answer. The answer is because <laughs> we want to be bringing theater everywhere. We want to, and like, obviously sometimes limitations add to things, like add to a show. Sometimes the more limitations you have, the more creative you get to be. But yeah. I think because they settled on maybe this perfect way to show this moment, and now you're trying to like make it something else, it just feels like less than. And maybe for someone who'd never seen it before or wouldn't know, this would be the perfect way. Fine. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I, I really think because I have this, like, yeah. vivid comparison in my mind, it's just, like, a disappointing. But I would love to know how they did it New York Theatre Workshop, Citadel, the yeah, first production in London. In like, really small Oh, spaces. first production of London, they did have the uh, drop, because oh, I've yeah. seen that bootleg. But um, I don't think they would have had it at Citadel, and I don't think they would have had it at New York Theatre Workshop. I imagine they'll have it in the West End, because yeah. that just feels more... Yeah, I think they will. For like bigger sit downs, um, they'll have it. Um, anything else you wanna you wanna get off your chest about this? Show? Um, I'll talk about something that I like. Okay, great. Are you ready? Um, yeah. I do think. I mean, obviously, theater is the way that this story has been told for thousands of years, and I do think there's something super beautiful about, you know, this is a myth that they say, you know, we. Orpheus is doomed to make the same mistake over and over and over again. And Hermes is doomed to tell the story over and over and over again. That's kind of his punishment. And every year, Persephone... We're going to sing it again We're going to sing it again and again and again. And And I think there's something magical about the fact that you go into a theater and you watch this story. And they're like, we're going to do it again. And then they really do do it again the next night. You know what I mean? And that's like magical theater. And similar with, with every show. But they really work in... This is a theater specific thing. Like to me, a movie of this would not work because the what Mm-mm. works about it is that tomorrow night we'll be here and we'll be telling the same sad story again. Um, and I think like it's the perfect venue for that. Tomorrow they'll actually be doing it twice. Uh, tomorrow they'll be doing it in the afternoon <laughs> and in the evening, you know, and they'll do it again and again. They'll do it again and again and again. And yeah. that like that that part of it really moves me for some reason. Wow. So that the end the, of the show the is end really what where they're like, <laughs> and we're gonna do it again. And I'm like, and they are gonna do it again. Should we rate it? Okay, wow. I'm gonna give two ratings. You're gonna give two ratings, okay. Based on my first experience and my second experience. Your sex experience? Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll go first. My rating would be Six out of ten red carnations. Oh God, that's, I, that's like high for you. I feel like you gave Joseph like five. I can't remember what I gave Joseph, but <laughs> Joseph actually does suck. But I did have a better time. So there's that. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, my Broadway rating for this would be 8.5 out of 10 because I had a very like high emotional experience at it. Um, I would say 8.5 out of 10 red Reef Carney bandanas. <laughs> Um, and then I would say my Toronto uh, rating would be seven out of ten. What did you What did you rate yours? Red carnations. Oh, I was gonna say that, but I'm not gonna say that. Um, Hermes little wings. Um, Look at that. Eight seven seven out of ten. Seven out of ten. Yeah, I would recommend this. Um, I think you and your mom would say. The rush price is the correct price for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's on stage at the Royal Ox till August 20th. 
And is it going on tour? Is the tour continuing after, or are we the final stop? We're, we're a lot of times question. the final stop, but we're the final know. stop for Hamilton right now. Yeah, that's why they are, could wait. Extend. Are we? Yeah, that's why they could extend two times. Hades Town tour, um, North American tour site. Let's see. Not subscribe tour. Uh, no, they're going to Ottawa next. Oh, Ottawa. They're going to Ottawa and then San Francisco and then Sacramento and then San Jose and Is then Los Angeles and then Seattle and then Vancouver and then Edmonton and then Calgary and then Boise oh, and then so the tour Albuquerque. has a lot of places to Did go. Did it just start? Did it just pick back up? Wow. Um, they're not done until Charlotte, North Carolina, May seventh to May twelfth, twenty twenty four. Wow. There will be many casting overhauls in for that sure. Time. Um, for sure they performed on James Corden like last year I think and it was a completely different cast so national tours have a lot yeah. of turnover usually yeah um, yeah so that's our thoughts on Hades Town, and now it's time for our obsession of the week my obsession of the week this is kind of a re-obsession but it's a different version of a song that I've been obsessed with before so recently where was it where was this production of Chess, Tara? Tell me where this production of Chess was. <laughs> Wait, the most recent one? Yeah, where was this most recent one? Was it a The Muni! It was the Muni! It was the Muni! It was the Muni. Um, so Jessica Vosk was in this production of Chess, and she shared a video of herself. But you know what she put over it? She put over it her version from her album, Wild and Free, of her singing oh, Nobody wow. Side. And then I was like, let's go listen to that. And she sounds amazing. It is just, she always sounds amazing, but... Truly just a masterclass version of this song. Um, the, the way I texted you last week being like, do we need to go to the Muni? <laughs> it's just so far. It's so far, but apparently this production of Chess was like the best version of Chess that has ever had. John Riddle as the American? Who was the other guy? It was also no someone clue. that, was it Jared Spector? That sounds right, but no clue. I think Jared Spector was actually the American and John Riddle was the Russian. Because Jessica Vosk, I think, was John Riddle's, like, wife, and Taylor Latterman was Jared Spector's, which is kind of random casting, but, like, whatever. Love, it. Love that for them. But um, the staging and the screens and everything looked really well done. Truly, maybe the first time I realized it was about chess, to be honest. Um, <laughs> because they were never, actually playing chess. It never occurred to me before what it was about. What it was, what it was about. Um, honestly, just her voice at all times, but specifically singing Nobody's Side. Nobody, if you. No, no, no. Never take a stranger's <laughs> advice. Never let a friend fool you twice. She doesn't do that. That's the Julia Murnie no, version. No, she doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> but, but she sounds amazing. It's just so crisp. She's so crisp. It's good. It's a great song. Yeah. So yeah, Jessica um, Vosk on her album, Wild and Free, singing No. I don't sad. think I've ever... What else is on that album? Does she have any Wicked stuff on there? Let's look. Let's Maybe up. not. Maybe it's too early. Because Wicked was... Jessica Vosk. De- decently recent. Wild and Free came out in 2018. Oh, so maybe. Um, it opens with a million dreams. We've like got Greatest Showman. Greatest Showman, I believe. Yeah, I'm not listening. What Bacon Can Do is on it. Wow, I should oh, this great. album. Chandelier by oh. Sia. Okay. Nothing compares to you by Sinead O'Connor. Wow, one of my favorite songs ever. Nothing compares to wow. you. Wow. It all fades away as the closer. Ah. Uh. Well, no wicked. You're, you just pick. You just pick. Nobody said because you knew it. But maybe you should have been listening to the whole album. Maybe this will be. Maybe this will appear oh again in a different Help, session. Which I'm assuming is the Beatles song slash Being Alive. <gasps> wow. wow. <laughs> Jessica Vosk's album Wild and Free. Listen, stream <laughs> the it. Whole the stream whole thing. Streaming. Stream it. Um, we can listen to that later. I, there's so many. There's so many people that have done these like individual concept albums that. I love. They're just I like find great stuff. Great stuff. I find the covers of them horrible. They're always the worst headshot. Look at this cover. It's so bad. Yeah, that's not what I expected. What is Casey Levy also has a bad cover. They're so bad. Yeah. The covers are horrible. <laughs> so talk to me. Let me help you. Why are you doing this? Yeah. Why are you being like great question? Pondering. Why are you pondering? <laughs> Who designed this? What graphic designer? designed this i don't know graphic design is my passion okay go on (laughs) tara what is your obsession this week okay my obsession this week um i actually can't believe we haven't talked about it because it's been a year and i feel like we probably should have talked about it like 
last February, but it kind of feels timely because today um, was the announcement that here we are, the final Sondheim musical tickets went on sale um, mm. for The Shed. It's off-Broadway, right? The Shed is off-Broadway? Yeah. Um, in the fall. Oh, that's something we could potentially add to the list. It's a good cast, everybody. It's I just think it's going to be hard to get a good ticket. The tickets went on sale today, so who yeah. actually knows? But... Um, the reason I'm bringing that up is because if we all remember the 2022 Grammys, the In Memorial was a Sondheim tribute. And I can't believe we haven't talked about this on the podcast because that so was true. one of the best tribute performances maybe ever. I mean, obviously, like, meant more to us as people that actually sure. knew all of those songs than your everyday Grammy watcher. But it featured Ben Platt, Rachel Zegler, Cynthia Revo, and Leslie Odom Jr. And I just remember like watching it on my couch and Rachel walking up in that red dress. And I'm like, this girl has never looked more beautiful ever. And then when she started singing, There's a Place for Us, I started crying because I was like, this is this is so beautiful. And then when the yes. four of them do that, like beautiful four part harmony, Cynthia Revo is singing like Send in the Clowns in the background. It's just a really, really well mastered like medley of Sondheim songs. And I wish they would have like recorded it and released it because I would download it instead of watching the In Memoriam <laughs> again on YouTube. So I was like, oh, remember when they died? Remember them? But yeah, it like came up on a suggested on YouTube. And I love when YouTube suggests things for me that I've already watched like 10 times. It's like, you know what? I will watch that one more time. (laughs) Click. Yeah. Um, So it kind of like recently came up for me. And I was like, oh, I don't think we've ever talked about this. And we should have because it was such an amazing tribute. Um, So like the entire thing. But really when Rachel comes in to start singing There's a Place for Us is when it was like, damn, this girl's voice. It was also like. That must have been right after West Side Story was released. Yeah, it would have been. It would have been. Yeah. And I think... So... So it was... uh, Of those, was she the only one who'd worked with Sondheim? Am I making that up? I... I don't know, but that sounds kind of right. I don't think I can't recall, like, Ben or Cynthia or, like, Leslie Adam Jr. doing... No. Sondheim shows. And I also remember at the time, like... Not that Ben Platt is much older than Rachel, but I just remember like watching it and being like, "Look at this girl singing with these people!" Like the star is that's born. Cynthia. That's Cynthia Arrivo up though. there. <laughs> no, that's, for sure. That's Aaron Burr himself up there. Like it just felt like, oh man, this like teenager is singing with these like masterclass singers, and she's blowing them all out of the water. <laughs> that year for her was really like a star making year, and now she's got other stuff coming up. She's got. Mo- like the the most recent or the the most upcoming is the Hunger Games prequel. Yes, that's the which I feel one. like I will see in theaters. I am into it. I think I should try and read the book, The Ballad of Songbirds oh, yeah. and Snakes. Should I try and read the book? I think she's is she like singing in this movie too? I think she does have like a song or I two. I think she's like an artist, like a singer in the in the book in the show. In yeah, the movie. I think she is. Um, And then I don't even know when it's going to be released because obviously with the strike going on and reshoots, but like Snow White has been on the radar for a very long time. Yeah. And she'll definitely be singing in that. So I did receive word today. I saw not word. I saw on social media. This is irrelevant, but relevant that Bridgerton season three is completely wrapped (laughs) and edited and everything. We really have to always just bring it back. Well, because the strike makes a difference, but it's fully Yeah, but you know it's going to be devastating to you when they can't do press. Oh, I actually will cry because <laughs> that does give me life when they do press. Also, something that's thrilling to us currently is the Ariana Grande, Jonathan Bailey romance rumors <laughs> that's happening on the internet right now because people are learning for the very first time that Jonathan Bailey is not straight. And I feel like we learned this information when season two of Bridgerton came out. We when learn everyone it was like, anew every year, <laughs> every year, I feel. Every year, every it's time, a Every time he's with a woman somewhere, we're questioning his sexuality. Someone, someone's <laughs> just like, maybe he's just a nice man. <laughs> I think that's it. I think that's it. My favorite tweet, I think I sent it to you, was Ariana's already got another white boy on roster. And then they're like, and so does he. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he is looking great right now. He's giving his Fiero Tigular minus <laughs> the like frosted weird tips. highlight that he had. Chop that yeah. off. Chop it off. No, maybe he's there's got a picture on the tips. internet. My guess, maybe yeah. he has frosted tips when they're at, like, shiz, and then in, like, act two moments, oh. he doesn't have the frosted tips to make him look younger. But the pictures that we saw of him would have been, like, thank goodness time. Yeah, so I actually don't know. I don't so, know. 
debunked. Um, but my favorite picture on the internet right now is Ariana in the middle of Andrew Garfield and Jonathan Bailey because yeah. that is that's my actually dream. The, the true obsession. That is the true obsession of the week. Also, (laughs) the tweets of, like, she's wearing these, like, circular glasses. They're like, she definitely stole those from the Wicked set. set. I like challengers. It's giving um, uh, one short day. It's giving, yeah, what are those glasses called? The, like, whatever. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, for Wizomania. They definitely haven't started any post-production on Wicked, so we actually don't know when we'll be seeing that movie. Although the crew isn't on strike. Yeah. Allegedly, another news as of today, allegedly Wicked is done filming. Yeah, allegedly, they, Ariana Grande is going back to the U.S. tomorrow. All all they have to do, I think, is what, what we've heard is shoot some background artist stuff. Although they haven't even, I'm sure, started looking at this footage. And I imagine there's reshoots that need to happen. Probably so. ADR. Yeah. Any yeah, of yeah, that, yeah. which they can't do at this time. No. And so then also when of- you're... When you're editing, so the thing is, to do reshoots, right, you have to have who's going to write those reshoots, who's writing the extra scenes that they think they're missing, who can decide what scenes are missing, a writer, and you can't do that right now. You know so what? We're, it's Chu, a hot mess. John Chu, just release the rough cut. I yeah, know it's probably good. like eight hours, but like, I'll watch it. We good. Give it to us. <laughs> yeah. Just release the rough cut. But um, kind of interesting because I feel like the last time there was like an actor strike, like, a lot of people came back to the theater, so maybe we'll be seeing some more celebs in theaters. So I don't know. It's kind of like a weird time right yeah. now, um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, that is our episode. That's our obsession of the week. That's our thoughts on Hades Town. And our next episode is on um, Stratford's production of Rent, which we gave you a little tease, and that's all we're gonna give you. Um, but yeah, I don't even know. There's no way to prep for this episode unless you actually go out to Stratford and see Rent, which I highly recommend you do. Absolutely. <laughs> but maybe not within the next, like, two weeks. <laughs> it's unrealistic. Um, so, yeah, that's our next episode. Um, we're very excited to talk about the show. And um, until then, you can listen to any of our other episodes by subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also watch us on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a comment. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and threads. At Off to Bayway Podcast with the number two. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.